Welcome to lecture 21, Language and Thought, Thinking and Language. Language and thought are very, very closely related. When your language use is sloppy, when it's indistinct, when it's imprecise, when it's foolish, when it's inaccurate, it leads to the same sorts of thinking processes. Our language and our thought are interrelated. We think in language. The better your thinking, the better your language. The better your language, the better your thinking. Because these things are totally and absolutely interrelated. I just said that. Okay. We look at vague and imprecise language, it leads to vague and imprecise thinking. We tend to spell the words the way we, the way we pronounce them. If you speak in incomplete sentences, you probably think in incomplete sentences. Uh, okay, gotta flip my page. When we look at the evolution of language, excuse the minor interruption here, move over. When we look at the evolution of language, there is no grandfather language. There is no one language that started it all. Instead, what we have is families of language. And there is some controversy about how these things are all organized, but we still have these families of language. The Celtic language, Romantic languages, uh, Germanic languages, and they all kind of fall in there. And there's some dispute about which one of these branches English might fall under, because English is such uh, a mixed up language. But it's still not, there's no grandfather language that they all sprung from. It's this developed over time in, in various regions. One thing is for sure is that language changes and evolves. The language we speak today is not really the same language we spoke in the history. And the language we speak today is not going to be the same language that our uh, grandchildren speak later on. It's a constant growing and evolving process. New words are added to our language, old words fall out of use, the meanings of words change, and you can probably think just right in, in your time about the, the meaning, uh, how different words have changed their meanings. I have some examples of this with the Lord's Prayer. And unfortunately, I'm not going to show this video here on this short little recording because of copyright issues, and the same with all the videos on, on this one. Uh, in the lecture notes I have, or in the handout that I gave you, I hand out a copy of the uh, Old English in, uh, excuse me, the, the Lord's Prayer in Old English. If you try and read that, it's very, very difficult, but it is still written in English. This little video is the Lord's Prayer. Somebody's actually pronouncing the words appropriately, which there's no way I could possibly do it. If you do a quick YouTube search on Old English and Lord's Prayer, you'll pull up several videos on somebody actually pronouncing those. Move on later on into Middle English, and again, another video I'm not going to show. When Middle English comes around, the, again, the words are very, very difficult for us to pronounce today, but the rhythm starts to get there. And you can recognize, even if you didn't know what the words were, as you heard this rhythm, as somebody speaking it, you would be able to recognize this as the Lord's Prayer. And the same evolution is still occurring in how our language adapts. And so, you know, a thousand years from now, people read what we've written and go, huh? Just like we read what they've written and go, huh? So there's all sorts of stuff. When we look at language, two things. One is signs of nature. They're natural. You know, you have the smoke coming up from, from the fire. It's a sign that there's a fire. That's not what we consider language. In language, we look at the symbols of man, that we create symbols and give those symbols meaning. Uh, language is really only a series of sounds or a series of written symbols that have no meaning in and of themselves. It's the culture, the society, that gives those sounds or those written words actual meaning. Language is just a system for thinking and communicating. That's a very general thing of language. When we look at language, the total meaning of language, we need to look at uh, the semantic meaning 
or another term for this is the denotative meaning, which is the dictionary definition. What does the word mean? The perceptual meaning or the connotation is what is the emotional impact that these words actually have. The syntactic meaning is not what the word means, but how the word is used within a sentence. And the pragmatic meaning or the situational meaning because some sentences quite literally have, they don't make sense unless you were there. You really had to be there. So let's look at these one at a time. Start out with the semantic meaning. The semantic meaning uh, is the, defi the dictionary definition. You simply look it up, you know, chair represents this thing that I'm sitting on. College education relates to this experience that you're going through. It's simply the, the dictionary definition. The perceptual meaning uh, brings in the thoughts and the, the feelings behind this, all those emotions. We have many, many words in our language that bring up emotion. This little test, the, this little list I have here, just four of them. The word test brings up certain emotions in people. If I walk into class and I hand out the students a, an exam and I say, today we're going to have a test, certain emotions come up just with that word. Um, the word cozy, nice little pleasant emotions. The word love. And every racial, sh racial slur you've ever heard or you've ever said only has, it's only a word, but what makes it a racial slur is that uh, perceptual meaning behind it, the connotation, all of those emotions. The syntactic meaning is how a word is actually used within a sentence. Dog bites man is significantly different than man dot bites dog. Lots of different ways we can put these things together and how the words are arranged even though the words themselves mean the same thing how they're arranged the whole meaning of the phrase changes with the syntactic meaning I have a good example of this uh, coming up later on so we'll get to it here in just a little bit the oh no I do have it right here the Jabberwocky and here I have a little video that I show in class with actually a professional actress pronouncing all these words. But because of copyright, I'm going to read the poem Jabberwocky to you. Here goes. Jabberwocky by Lewis Carroll. Twas brillig, and the slithy toes did gyre and gimble in the wabe. All mimsy were the borough goes, in the moan's wrath outgrave. Beware the jabberwock, my son, the jaws that bite, the claws that catch, Beware the jub-jub bird, and shun the frumious bandersnatch. He took his vorpal sword in hand, long time the maxim foe he sought. So rested he by the tum-tum tree, and stood a while in thought. And, as in uffish thought he stood, the jabberwock, with eyes aflame, came whiffling through the tulgy wood, and burbled as it came. One, two, one, two, and through and through the vorpal blade went snicker-snack. He left it dead, and with its head he went galumping back. And hast thou, sh has, and hast thou slain the Jabberwock? Come to my arms, my beamish boy. O oh, frabjous day, calhu calhay! He cohortled in his joy. Twas brillig, and the slithy toves did gyre and gimble in the wave. All mimsy were the borogoes, and the moan's wrath outgrave. Now, when I read this poem by Lewis Carroll. There is very few words in this poem that we actually know. Lewis Carroll made up a whole bunch of words. But this poem makes sense. In class, when we sit down and talk about this poem, you can actually understand what this poem is saying, not because we know the meaning of the words, but because we understand the syntax of how the words were used in the sentences. It's an important aspect for us to understand the true meaning of the word. The pragmatic meaning of, of any word or any phrase is you had to be there. If you weren't there, it simply doesn't have a meaning. If I say close the door and there's nobody to, I'm not saying to anybody, that doesn't have any, any meaning. Or if there's no door to close, it doesn't have any meaning. If I say that student is smart, but I'm not directing my gaze or I'm not pointing at some student, then this simply has uh, no meaning whatsoever. If I ask you, what is this, and we're in an entirely different room, the sentence doesn't make any sense to you. This is the pragmatic meaning. Take a look at some fun examples. The meaning, to serve man. It could be a cookbook, 
A nice famous science fiction movie was on this one, To Serve Man. That same phrase in a slightly different context. How about To Serve Man? Show her it's a man wor man's world. She's kind of kneeling down there and serving him breakfast in bed. How about this one, To Serve Man? When we're talking about a tennis match. To Serve Man. We have a waitress. To Serve Man. How about religiosity? To Serve Man. How about military or serving man? Using language effectively. To develop the ability to use language effectively to communicate your thoughts, feelings, and experiences, you have to understand how language functions when it's used well. One way to do this is really to read widely. By reading as many good writings as possible, possibly you can, you get the feel of how language can be used effectively. You can get more specific uh, ideas by analyzing the works of highly regarded writers who use their meaning accurately. They also use many action verbs, concrete nouns, and very vivid adjectives to communicate effectively. Communicating your ideas effectively involves, involves using this full range of words to express yourself. When we use language to clarify our thinking because our language and our thoughts are so closely interrelated that as we start working on clarifying our language, we also start working on clarifying our thinking. And, <coughs> excuse me, language is a tool that's powered by the patterns of our thoughts and then the patterns of our thoughts are reflected back in our language. I love the phrase, once you open your mouth, you tell the world all about yourself. And if you don't speak well, you're saying that about yourself to the world. I don't speak well, I don't think well, all sorts of stuff. And language is social. If you lived all by yourself out in the woods somewhere and there's nobody else around, you simply wouldn't have the need for language. But language is the social thing. And we always use language in a social context. We use, hopefully, language that's inappropriate for social context. Languages vary everything from the informal to the very formal. You know, when you're chit-chatting with your friends and you're sending text messages and the textees and the emails, very, very informal language. Your friends can complete your sentences for you. However, in a formal style, that's not appropriate and you need to change the way you can communicate a little bit. Our standard formal language is called Standard American English, and this is where our rules of grammar come in, our rules of spelling, our rules of even essay format, how to write things, how to communicate things. And the ability to use Standard American English marks a person as part of an educated group that understands how to use language, that actually does have a, a positive thought process. <coughs> language has social barriers. <coughs> We're all familiar with slang. The slang that you use is different than the slang that your children use. The slang that you use is different than the slang that your parents use. Your grandparents use different slang. So slang is a very restrictive type of language that really identifies people into a, a social group that they use this. Another type of language or, or language boundary is jargon. No matter what occupation you're in, you probably have terminology in that occupation that's specifically used in that occupation. At college, you're going to take a whole course in medical terminology because you have to know that jargon in order to work in the field. In the computer science world, in the graphic arts world, they have their own language to explain what's going on. In the business world, the the terminology that used to specifically talk about something in business, they may be the same words in your everyday conversation, but they have entirely different meaning. Those words have t taken on jargon. And we have dialect. Dialect identifies uh, where somebody is from geographically, because the different areas of the world have different dialects. Even though people all around the United States speak English, Somebody from Texas is going to have a slightly different dialect than somebody from Maine or somebody from Washington or somebody from Florida, somebody from Colorado. And we're able to identify this. Even though they speak English in the United Kingdom, 
we can recognize not only with their slightly different terminology, but through their dialect. We use language to influence. We can convince people to do things. We can intimidate people to do things. It's, we use language to manipulate people to buy products. I'm using language to communicate all sorts of concepts to you. Uh, very powerful use. And if you're not good at using language, then somebody else can use language very well and manipulate you very well into buying products or to believing certain things. Remember, one of the main goals of this course is that after this course is over, you'll have the skills to be conned less often. And one of the main ways I con you is through language and the use of language. We want to get into looking at some euphemism language. Come on, there it goes, euphemisms. Euphemisms quite literally means, the word itself means to speak with good words. It's when you take a word that you don't want to use and you substitute a nicer sounding word for it. Think of when you start talking about death. <coughs> we don't typically talk about death. We don't talk about somebody dying. Some, we talk about somebody who has passed on. They've gone to a better world. They've gone to visit the farm. They've kicked the bucket. All sorts of other things. Think about all the words you have to describe uh, the bodily functions of defecating or urinating. We have lots of other words. You know, you don't walk up and somebody say, I gotta defecate today. It's time for me to go to the bathroom and urinate. You know, we have all these other uh, words to uh, describe this. In war, civilians are never killed. In war, we have collateral damage. So. I have several videos here on, on euphemisms. Some of them are very, very good. You can simply do a YouTube search uh, for euphemism and you'll pull up dozens of these things. If I can get this to move on here. And move on, there we go. Our emotive language plays this double role. It not only symbolizes what we're talking about, but it expresses our feelings. And it also evokes feelings in others. And we are naturally emotional creatures. We're not naturally logical individuals. We make decisions subconsciously. We make decisions emotionally. We choose things emotionally. And if I can use my emotive language to bring up emotions in you, then I can get you to do things. I can get you to, to vote a certain way. I can get you to buy certain products. Vague and imprecise language leads to vague and imprecise thoughts. For example, the words good, better, large, small, those are all very, very vague. This, that, it, those, them, they, they're imprecise. They really don't point to anything. How about almost, about, close? The one that people use all the time is like. Well, he has like six kids. Does that mean he has six kids or does it mean he has five or seven? Well, five or seven is like six, so who knows? like six kids. The relationship between language and thought is highly interrelated. That the better your language, the better your thinking. And the better your thinking, the better your language. One of the best ways of working on your improving your thinking is to improve uh, how you speak, how you use the language. Lots of ways of doing this. One of the best ways is to read. Read widely and read the material, the books that are classics. Read the excellent writing. Read those excellent journalists, the ones that the, the have been around for a long time. They write well, they express themselves well, they express the thoughts appropriately and well using the English language. I want to thank every one of you for being part of this course. This is Bruce Porter.